the Bank Ghana. Dog Tass Exclusive. Move and Pick Ambassador Hotel. Supported by Mahalia Collection. Crazy Daisies. The Club G100. Self Search. Weller Dazzles. Beldel Artistry. Imfunifie. <laughs> Thank you for making time to join me for another episode of the Natalie Ford Show, where we have conversations that matter. Tonight on the show, we discover the man behind what has grown to become Ghana's first watchmaking company, Caveman Watches. Starting the business with only 50 CDs to breaking in millions, Anthony Jamifer opens up about his story and success is chalked over the years as well as the sacrifices that he had to make to create the life of his dreams. That's tonight on the Natalie Ford Show. Anthony, welcome to the Natalie Ford Thank Show. Thank you very much. It's so good to have you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Yeah. Yes. So Anthony, my first question, always the same question. <laughs> What's the state of Anthony's life right now? <sighs> Organized chaos. <laughs> <laughs> corporate organized chaos. Wow, corporate organized chaos. Yeah, That's a lot. Yeah, Why? it's difficult. I mean, um, entrepreneurship in Ghana is very hard. The economy is not helping very much. The dollar rate is crashing on us. But yeah, we're still managing to, I mean, put things together. That's why uh, I call it corporate chaos, but it's okay. organized. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Anthony? What's the state of your life, not your work, not your business's life? Actually, it's like I'm always thinking about, about work. work. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony is caveman, right? Yeah. Yeah. My life, um, it's mostly work. Mostly just work. Um, it's not much happening in my life personally. Oh. <laughs> not much. I have a boring life. It's just work, home, work, home, play basketball, get back to work. So yeah, not much happening, unfortunately. Unfortunately? So in your own life, your private life, you'd say it's boring? Very boring. <laughs> Very boring. Very boring. If you take the work out of my life, um, play basketball for fun, mm. apart from that, there's nothing to it. Sadly. Oh, that does sound a bit sad. Oh, it's okay. But you're, you enjoy it, you're happy, yeah? I do, yeah. I think I got this obsession with my work and um, it's kind of brought me very far. Mm. But I had to make sacrifices, you know. I sacrificed my social life yeah. to build what I'm building. So it's, it's worth it. Yeah. It is. But how, how did you, 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 are you an extrovert or an introvert? Intro. You're an intro. <laughs> I, I can, can tell. stand yeah. um, settings with a lot of people. Mm. The only times I'm going out uh, is a business seminar, an award night, mm. you know, things that relate to work, business life. Yeah. But, you know, just to go out, chill with the boys kind of thing. I can stand loud. But you, have you have friends? A few friends. few friends, yeah. I have a few friends. I have a lot of business associates, mm. but. Private lives as few friends. Yeah? Yeah. Have you always been that way? I've always been that way. I think we were raised like that. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, we used to, you know, kind of family that your mom locks you guys home the whole time. And how, it, many, how many siblings? I have three siblings. Okay. We have four guys. Mm -hmm. I happen to be the third. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's how we grew up, just en enclosed in our yeah. house. People hardly Sheltered. come. Shel people hardly come visit us. So, you know, <laughs> really? It was a very guarded house. Uh -huh. By 7 p.m., you had to be home. You know? So anytime I go to the basketball court with my friends and it's getting to 7 p.m., I could mm. tell them that the next phone call I would get would be my mom. <laughs> and it would be my mom. Where are you? It's uh -huh. late. I'm like, it's just 7. Okay. It's late. Even now, if I should go home to our family yeah. house, my mom could call me at 7 p.m. That Where are you? Wow. It's late. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Did you enjoy the ch your childhood? I didn't enjoy that part of it, but I appreciate it now. I think uh, being able to filter out all the unnecessary things and be very focused has helped me. 
Uh, people used to laugh at me back then. They were like, oh, your mom is controlling you people too much. <laughs> but now I kind of understand mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. I believe that if I had uh, too much freedom, I may have ended up doing something else that may not have benefited me. So, yeah. But how do you think it hurt you? How did how it hurt me? How do you think that me? upbringing hurt you? Um, did it hurt me in any way? Or back the disadvantages then, I mean, back then, I didn't used to like it because, you know, all your friends have the freedom. They are out partying the night, doing all these things, and you have to be home. Back then, I didn't enjoy it, but now, yeah, you do. I'm okay with it, yeah. What about your father? My dad, her. My dad is not alive anymore. Mm. Rest in peace to the old boy. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> the old boy. Old boy, so yeah. Rest in peace, yeah. But my dad was a very um, strict person. It was weird. He used to be very friendly when he had money. But when he's broke, <laughs> you know, the moment we hear his car coming, everybody runs from the living room into your bedrooms. Wow. Yeah, so it was kind of like a very quiet home when my dad didn't have money. And I didn't like it. When he didn't have money, it was When quiet. he didn't have, ha have money, it was quite very quick-tempered, mm. you know. And I didn't like it. Yeah. I hated it. I can imagine. But I told myself that um, there are times I used to look at him and be like, Charlie, if you are broke, don't come and put it on us. Yeah. I, you know? But yeah, I'm like, what if the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree? What if? Mm. I wouldn't want to have a home where my financial difficulties would make me put some kind of tension yeah. in my home. In home. So growing up, it made me um, decide to not grow up and be broke. Yeah. And probably have to put the frustration on my children, oh. like my dad yeah. was doing to us. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> How was school like for you? Ah, very difficult. Where was school? Where did you go to school? I attended um, Maoli Junior, Se uh, Junior Secondary School. Okay. Uh, then I went to St. Paul's Junior Secondary School in the Volta region. Mm -hmm. uh, then to UPS. Okay. Um, I always had a very tough time Why? in school. I think I was such a rebel. Really? <laughs> Yeah, it was very difficult for me to go through um, probably a week or two of sanity in school. How? I was always trouble. I was always feeling in trouble. It's like right after this, the next. What were you doing? Because you sound like one who was, was, like you said, introverted. Yeah, so that was what got you into trouble. <laughs> breaking rules every now and then. Um, I don't know, but I feel like um, a lot of times I would stand up to teachers and be very vocal about my opinions yeah. and I figured that was not our culture, mm. it was not very common. Mm -hmm. So I used to get in trouble for, you know, saying things to teachers that I thought were just opinions. Yes. I didn't think I was disrespecting anybody, mm -hmm. but the fact that I had the confidence to stand, to stand up, up yeah. it kind of rubbed off wrongly, so yeah, I used to get in trouble a lot. Sometimes, you know, truancy every now and then. <laughs> okay. um, uh. When break time is over, I could probably come back an hour late from break. An hour? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's funny. You didn't care? I don't know. I was always falling in trouble. Hmm. It was even worse uh, in secondary school. It's very bad. What happened in secondary school? Um, okay, so for example, hmm. The headmaster brings three students to the assembly okay. Okay, to make an example out of them. Mm. That these three people were found walking around on campus during class period. Mm. And that's a huge, I mean, uh, offense in school. So he brings these three scapegoats and okay. dismisses them. Yeah. You know, so the whole, the whole morning there's tension. Like mm -hmm. Everyone is quiet because yeah. the headmaster is really mad. Yes. And the... Order is any student found walking around campus mm -hmm. during class period would be dismissed. So we all go to class and the whole campus is quiet. People are terrified. I sit in class and one or two lectures fail to show up. Yeah. And I feel like just going to the dormitory to sleep. I'm likely to pick my bag and just walk out. And everybody's like, what's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with him? So I could just walk comfortably heading to the dormitory to sleep. I could bump into a f one or two teachers who also look at me of like, course. like <laughs> they can't doing? believe yeah. that uh -huh. a student right yeah. after what happened this yeah. morning will be walking. I just pass by. I could greet them and walk and by walk and go and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're, rebe you're rebellious, I guess. I think I had, this streak strong, of rebellion. I had this strong sense of freedom. Freedom. Mm. Uh, 
which I mean, I had to fine tune it to find a good balance. Yes. Uh, having a sense of freedom doesn't mean that I should be breaking rules or disrespecting yeah. people. So maybe I didn't do a very good job at fine-tuning it, but I knew I had it. Yeah. So if a rule didn't make sense to me, I was very likely to break it. I like it. that, in a way. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. very likely to break it, you know. Yeah. So it, it used to follow me. You valued freedom and yeah. independence. Yeah. yeah. So at that stage of your life, mm -hmm. did you know what you wanted, what sort of future you wanted to have? I had no clue. <laughs> At all? Sad, yeah, I huh. think um, when I was in secondary school, I was a science student. Okay. So my behavior was not that of a typical science student. <laughs> you know, the science yeah. students were thought to be very nerdy and uh -huh. quiet and well behaved. And I was, you know, going around breaking rules. Breaking rules, yeah. Getting punished every now and then, dressing anyhow. Uh -huh. I didn't know, um, I was not enjoying the science very much. Sometimes I used to ask myself how I ended up doing yeah. science, but um, I didn't enjoy it so much. Uh, what did you I enjoy? Did you know at least what you enjoyed? One thing I knew was that out of the, the, the courses I read, I enjoyed the reading subjects more. So I used to fail chemistry. Yeah. But all. <laughs> but all. Mm. I could be in the lab and mix anything, yeah. not know what I'm doing. Um, yeah. Mm. So when I got to my final year in secondary school, mm. I think it was around that time that I started being very much aware oh, yeah. that I didn't want to do this anymore. Mm. Yeah. So when I was writing my final exam in secondary school, I was kind of writing it to just finish and rewrite it. Okay. It's weird. Uh -huh. I didn't want to continue the science path anymore. I wanted to finish and then get to remedial classes and mm. write business. Ah, uh, did you do that? That's what That's I did. What did yeah. So when I finished writing my science papers in secondary school, I took uh, a five-month business remedial okay. and I wrote business exams. So mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't want to allow me to do it initially. They were like, this is a whole four, three years or four years, mm -hmm. three years. Yeah program okay. and you want to use five months to join business mm -hmm. students and write the exam so I just told them I could do it I mean I felt like I had I had to comprehend more complex mm. questions doing physics and chemistry yes so I believe that I could you, you know had that you had the ability to yeah, yeah you know to comprehend the business courses so mm. I did that and I went to UPS mm -hmm. so it went well it went well yeah yeah it didn't go excellent. I couldn't get the degree. I had to go and do a diploma. Ah. So I did my diploma in UPS, then went to do my national service and came back to do my degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when, you, when did your professional life begin? And what did it begin with? Um, uh, around 2012. My dad passed in 2012. When my dad passed, I took some time, did my thinking. I used to look at my mom and be like, Charlie, there's four of us. How is she going to be able to fend for four of us? On what her was own? she doing for a living? My mom was a petty trader. She had a shop. She still has a shop. She still has a shop. So she'll come to Makola to buy goods, mm. and every now and then I'll come uh, with her to Makola. Mm. We used to live in Hope. Okay. So we'll come to Makola, buy stuff, take it back to the shop to sell. That's how she was, I mean, mm. with my dad together. Yeah. Now, my dad not being in the picture, I felt, nah, she can't look after four guys with this small shop mm -hmm. so um if i was not in a position to give her money the least i can do is not take money not from take her money from her yes so i made a decision to move from home to how move old were to you Accra. at this time uh how old is i in 2012 uh, if i tell you people will calculate and know how old how I'm. old are you <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so I, moved, you? I moved in 2012 um, like 18 in your teens <sighs> i just want to get a sense of of, of that because it would Help me better understand Probably what you were relieving 20, your mother of. 21 or 20. Okay. Yeah, so I moved to Accra. Mm. Um, just to start hustling, yeah. let me put it that way. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's how I moved and got a job mm. in a hotel. Okay, so you yeah. moved to Accra at around 2021. 20, yep. To hustle. Yep. How, describe the hustle. What was the hustling process like? Okay, so I remember um, my mom was taking me somewhere and I told her, Mom, I want to move to Accra. Mm. What's she, the reaction? She held on to the brakes <laughs> and looked at me like, where are you going in Accra? Who do you know in Accra? You know? Where yeah. are you going to live? And I said, well, we had these family friends. Um, 
uh, Brad David and okay. the, the family. Mm. They're living in Spintex. So I said, oh, I could patch there for a while and then rent a place. So she said, okay. I moved to Brad David's home. And uh, they were one of the people that motivated me a lot. You know, this kind of young couple that yeah. you could go into their home and be surprised that they own that, that huge own place. Yeah, so, you were inspired by them. Yeah, I was inspired yeah. by them to see a young um, young man make it that early. So it, it inspired me mm. to want to make it early, early enough. Yes. So I moved to Brad Dave's home and then I spent about a month while I was looking for a place to rent. Mm. So the first place I rented um, was in Medina. Uh, you literally open your arms and touch both walls. <laughs> You're joking. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's how I measured. Was it one bedroom? Was it one, it's not one, one bedroom. bedroom. It's a one, one room. room. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, you know, so you open both uh, both arms and you can touch you can both walls. <laughs> wow. So when I was going to buy the carpet for the floor, that's how I measured the room. So it's a very tiny space and then um, uh, you put a mattress on there. The mattress I took there, it was so thin that I folded it into a backpack. That's how the mattress was, like a blanket. Yeah. But one, when you put the mattress there and you lie on it, the moment you get up, you're at the door. <laughs> you know, so no it's like... To waste it. Wow, that's, that's small. Yeah, so that's how I yeah. moved No in, kitchen, um, no washroom, no nothing. Nothing, no. Mm -hmm. So you, you rented that home at Medina. Medina, yeah. And then at that time you were working with this hotel. Yeah. And how did that go? I was working and uh, schooling at the same time. So I was in a weekend school. Mm. So uh, my period working in the hotel was disastrous. Why? <laughs> I think it was that period that really shaped my life. Mm. That was like the apex of my transformation. Mm. Because um, I was heading to the hotel believing that I was very multi-talented. Yeah. Before then, uh, all my friends were like, oh, you were so good at different mm. things. I knew how to draw yeah. so well. People... I used to do the assignment for visual art students mm -hmm. when I was in school. Mm -hmm. I used to draw a lot mm -hmm. and I was very good at a lot of things. So I went to the hotel very optimistic Optimist. that I was going to, you know... Confident. You were going to I deliver. Was, yeah, like change. I was going yeah. to impress people. Yes. Uh, it didn't happen. <laughs> I think um, I got there and then started realizing that anytime... What did you realize? When anytime you we had meetings and I would raise my hand and give an idea then um, my boss would pass a very sarcastic comment and everybody would laugh. Oh, that sounds... I'd cool. be like, whoa, I thought that was a good mm. idea. Was I silly? Yeah. And it kept happening to the point that I started believing that I was not as much Why as I thought. Why do you think it was happening? I think um, if I could step back and look at myself, I would agree that my ideas could sound crazy to a lot of usual people. Usual people. Yeah, so anytime I said things, they thought, what's this guy saying? You know? Maybe I was not on the same le wavelength yeah. with them. Um, and that's one thing I know about ideas. Ideas initially, they don't sound... They sound silly. They yeah. sound silly unless you have the time and, you know, the foresight to see the finished yeah. version of it. But... It used to happen to me a lot, and I started calling into my shell. Mm. I would stop talking at uh, meetings. Wow. Even if I had questions, I would be asking the person beside oh, me. You were losing confidence. I lost you confidence. You lost confidence. I yeah. lost confidence, and I accepted it. Mm. You, know? you believed that that was who you were. Yeah, I believed that I was delusional, thinking I was smart. What were some of these ideas? Just give me one, if you recall. Um, I remember one time... My boss wanted to go out of the office to take a passport picture, okay? okay. Um, there, were these, there were these cards I used to print in the office that had like a laminated surface. Okay. So I just thought, wait, passport pictures look laminated, mm -hmm. right? How about if I take a picture of her with the camera we had in the office and just print it on the laminated That's card? Yeah. Wouldn't it have come out sort of like a passport picture? Mm -hmm. So instead of letting my boss just go out mm. to go and, you know, take her picture yeah. peacefully, mm. I owned up that, no, I can do it for you. Aww. She's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I can. You know, so I take the camera, I let her stand in mm. front of a white background, I mm. take the picture, 
So it's not anything I had tried before, before. but just because I had, yeah. I was thinking, mm, could it work? Could it work? Yes. I was curious to try it yeah. out. So I went out there to try it out. On your boss? Yeah, on my boss. For the boss. first time? <laughs> yes, for the first yeah. time. Uh -huh. And it, it didn't come out like how a professional passport picture would look. Yeah. I was in trouble. What was her reaction? Hey, as for this guy, this isn't like everybody. Oh, Anthony Dier, he thinks he knows everything. Anthony Dier, he's too long. Everything, he has some opinion about was like wow. usually ideas are not at just least perfect at exactly. the first exactly even if it doesn't work just celebrate the effort uh, well appreciate the effort so i felt like i didn't have the liberty to make mistakes mm. and correct mistakes yes. and practice my creativity yeah because as a creative person and a risk taker there is no guarantee that you'll get it right the first time Absolutely. but i didn't have that liberty to make any mistakes and yeah. perfect them so that used to worry me a lot and it was killing that creative yeah. part of me um we had the office was about we had about six seven people in the same mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. every time i was just being in the corner it's like i wanted to be invisible yeah. get out of people's way mm -hmm. and everybody could get close to my boss and talk to her freely yeah. but me it's like it was it was I, very bad yeah there was some time i remember very clearly i was walking into the office and I could hear people talking and laughing. The moment I entered the office, there was silence. Wow. I was like, it felt, it felt heavy. Heavy, exactly. Like, what, what was it? Yeah. And I was there, the mood changed. I went out and I heard voices again. Yeah. So you knew that it was your presence. Yeah. Was so in the office, there were times that I could leave and then go into the washroom and cry my cry. eyes out. Because at the time, I was also feeling that... Um, I chose to start working because my dad passed. Yes. I didn't know whether I was mentally ready, you know, to start working. But the fact that my dad had passed and I had to, you know, take that responsibility yeah. to try and help my mom, um, kind of did a thing to me. So I would go into the washroom and cry my eyes out and come back and to come my back. table. Yeah, but it was difficult. You were dealing with a lot. I was yeah. a lot, yeah. You were dealing with I a lot. Was my living conditions were not yeah. great. The salary was not anything. Yes. And then people weren't receiving you well in the environment. It was very hard. Yeah. I don't think that um, mentally I was in you a good place ready. at all. How long you know. did you work there for? I worked there for about three years, yeah. four years. About well, three years, yeah. yeah. That sounds a lot. <laughs> it it was, sounds heavy. It was. It's not the sort of environment for growth, no. I think. Yeah. But in spite of that, you managed to see the light somewhere and, of course, get yourself to where you are today. Yeah, yes. I mean, I had to resign to escape the environment. You know, it was the time that my general manager called me, and then I had gone to the airport before, and I realized one hotel had a lounge in the airport. They had a lounge in the airport when their guests come, they settle in before the shutters will come for them. Yeah. So the, my my general manager called me and told me that the hotel wanted to start a lounge. Okay. Oh, he said they had a lounge at the airport. Mm. And he wanted me to start that department. And he saw me to be a very friendly guy, receptive. So he wanted me to be uh, the one to start that department. So when the guests arrive, I receive yeah. them, I settle them in, and then call the drivers to come for them to the hotel. And then he asked if I would take the offer. I didn't even think twice. I wanted to get out of the office yeah. so bad. <laughs> yeah. But I just said, yes, I'll take it. Mm. I go back into the office and my boss asked me, what did the general manager say? And I told her, and she said, would you take the offer? And I said, yes, I'll take it. Mm. It didn't even take a day before uh, my replacements mm. had arrived. Right. <laughs> In my mind, I was like, whoa, that was quick. That was really fast. <laughs> that was really fast. Uh, so my replacements mm. was literally standing beside me while I was tidying my table. Yeah. And my boss assigned one of the managers to take me to the airport and help me settle in into this new department. We were sort of ready to have you. Very know. ready. <laughs> she was received the news with joy. I Very think. ready. Yes. So this man took me to the airport mm. to help me start that department. <laughs> then we go into the airport marketing office mm. and the manager is now asking the people, how do we get a table and a chair anywhere around the, off, around the airport for our worker? And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean a table and a chair? The manager told me we have a lounge at the yeah. airport. He was like, eh. It wasn't what you were expecting. I was like, no, Anthony, um, we don't have the lounge yet. And now the airport is charging us 
mm. this amount just to have a table and a chair anywhere around the airport for you. I don't think the hotel is going to pay that money. I'm like, okay, what are you saying? <laughs> Then he was like, well, your place in the office too has been taken already. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, what are you saying? Just, mm. what do yeah. I do? He said, okay, you know what? We have a, I have a plan for you. Mm. You just start working at the airport. We'll figure something out for you. I'm like, working where? As what? Just <laughs> <laughs> over hovering around the airport. Yeah, dragging over around the airport. Mm. You know, but long story short, they found a bench for me mm. in the arrival hall. So I, uh, and then they gave me a placard. So I go to the airport. When the, the planes arrive, mm. stand up and hold a placard above your head with the hotel name on it, hoping to find people, people who are going to lodge at that. Yeah. And that was your new job. That was my new job. From was like, your dream of it being in a lounge, yeah. <laughs> holding a placard. Yeah. I was like, whoa, mm. how did I get here? How did you get here? But I was there for a year. Mm. Um, it was very hard. That I period was hard. People but you know, used to I mock think me a lot. I <laughs> it's such moments yeah. that you discover what you really want in yeah. life and who you really want to be, right? Yeah, that was the turning point for me. Yeah. I'm going to hold you briefly. <laughs> and we'll continue with that and talk about the turning point and what the next chapters of your life after that look like. Okay. Stay with us here on the Nancy Fort Show. Good business means seeing the possibilities and maximizing opportunities. Making sure you have a responsive support system. That's your business goals. A partner that gives you a stable platform with reliable connectivity and seamless solutions and better understands the tools required to take you to the next level. With so many moving parts in running a business, we do our best to provide you with some stability. The only kind of stability you can find with MTN Business Broadband, the fastest and most reliable internet provider in Ghana, making sure you stay ahead and stay connected because we understand what makes your business tick. Sign up today on broadband.mtn.com.gh or call or WhatsApp 0244-308-111. MTN. Welcome back to the Natalie Ford Show, and I've been in conversation with Anthony. Anthony, you were talking about this <laughs> very turbulent experience from the hotel to working in the airport, yeah. and you said you worked there for a year. Tell me about, briefly, about what that was like, and then realizing your desire to set mm -hmm. up Caveman. So at the airport, um, uh, I, was, I started reading books on entrepreneurship. Okay. You know, anytime I sat there waiting for the planes, I'll be reading some books. And I started, get, I started getting ideas about entrepreneurship. And um, uh, one time I decided to resign. You know, I decided to resign. I, at the time, they were breaking the airport down to renovate the airport. Yeah. And uh, I came to work one day and then um, realized we had to move to the roadside. And I was like, Charlie. It was just getting worse and worse. It kept getting worse, yeah. you know. I mean, at the time. My boss said that, um, well, she wasn't wrong though. Mm -hmm. There are times that people come there and they can't find me. Because <laughs> instead of being at my post, I could sit there for some time. Like, what am I even doing here? Then I'll go home and sleep. Come back to work the following day in trouble. There was, I was not, my passion was not yeah, there. Yeah, you were so. not excited about it. Yeah, yeah, so I kept running away from work a lot mm -hmm. and getting into trouble for mm -hmm. it. So she recommended that they, they make me wear the, <laughs> the waiter's uniform. <laughs> You know, so oh I had a really? uniform now. The one so that they could spot you. They could spot me oh. if I was running away. <laughs> but I still used to run away. Then she yeah. was like, nah, they should give me a hat. So they gave oh me a hat. Oh my God, you're joking. <laughs> I wore the hat. <laughs> and they would send my food uh, from the hotel. Yeah. I have to find somewhere that yeah. cars are parked and squats in between to eat. Was, you were not happy. You were not I wasn't. It. I was yeah. not motivated. Absolutely. I was not focused. Yeah. I was not ready. Yeah. And it's, I mean, what hits me, it's, it's the same characteristic, say, at school, yeah. that you would walk out when <laughs> yeah. you're not, exactly. you know, you just, you just didn't believe in it. Yeah. So you were walking out in mm -hmm. this job as well, mm -hmm. in spite of them getting all the, the clothing items to spot you. I would still leave. When did the caveman dream 
begin and how? Okay, so I resigned from the airport mm -hmm. and I didn't have a job or anything when I resigned. I just had a plan. Okay. I was like, wait, I've been working in this hotel for some years now mm -hmm. and I don't have a savings. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. even have a city. Um, the money I was making in the hotel, before the month even ended, I would have borrowed some money from other people yeah. to survive. So before my salary came in, I had, you know, already had spent debt. it. <laughs> yeah. I had debt waiting mm -hmm. for me. So I was like, wait, what if I stayed home not working? But I had food in my fridge, and I had shelter, and I had time on my hands. So I believe I could put my creativity to use and do something. So I believe that I was too creative to have time on my hands yeah. and not make something, make something with it. With it. Yeah. So that was my plan, mm -hmm. to resign. You know, so I just one day went to the uh, CEO and told him that I just wanted to leave. To leave. Mm -hmm. So I resigned and um, stayed home. It was hard. The first few weeks after resignation was torturous. Mm -hmm. I would wake up and then go outside watching everybody going to work. Going to work. I felt alone in the yeah. world, like, have I done the right thing? Have you made the right decision? Could all these people be wrong mm. and me right? Mm -hmm. Everyone else was going to work. Mm. But I, I stayed, tried my hands on other businesses that failed. Mm. I would go to Circle and buy some suits, iron them to try and resell them. I tried a couple of things, didn't work out. But one day I walked into a shop to buy a watch. It was in 2015. The mm. first time in my life I wanted to buy a watch. I never liked watches. What got into you to buy the watch? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was starting mm. these new businesses, right, I wanted to just dress properly. Look yeah, the part. Yeah, look the part. Just yes. to look the part. So let me have a nice wristwatch. Uh -huh. So I walked into a shop and then um, the watch was 150 cities. Mm. I was like, that's expensive. Okay. <laughs> Common watch. Uh, I had only 50 cities on me, so I left and then I saw somebody selling a watch mm. on the internet and I called him. He came and I bought the watch for 50 cities, so I just wore the watch, took a picture of it, and someone saw the picture and said, Oh, it's a nice watch. Are you selling it? And I said, uh, Yeah. Yes. Ah. <laughs> then the person bought the watch and I was like, Wait. This could be a thing, right? I just made yeah. some profits without doing, doing any work. What if I sold two? What if I sold three? What if I sold four? So I called a supplier. And I was like, Charlie, the watch I bought from you, do you have more? Mm -hmm. He said, yes. And I'm like, let me buy two. Mm -hmm. So I used all the money and I bought two. Mm -hmm. I sold the two and I bought three. And I bought four and uh -huh, I bought and five. I kept <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. that's, and that's how it began. started. Yeah. So how did Caveman begin? How did your desire to set up your room? Yeah, yeah. so that came um, years after, about three years after I was just selling watches, mm -hmm. all these imported watches. Um, uh, but then the more I kept selling watches, I, I love adding value to whatever yeah. I'm doing. So I'm hardly ever um, stagnant. Mm. You know, when I enjoy a, a result, I want the next step, the next, the next step. To keep going. To keep going. Yeah. So selling watches, I was like, nah, that's not enough. Um, I identified that there was no particular organization in Ghana that was known for only watches. There were people who were selling watches, but they sold watches and perfumes mm. and belts and shoes. There was nobody that was known for just mm. watches. Yeah. So I thought that was a spot... Um, that I, I could feel, oh, yeah. So it's like, I always tell me that you identify a gap in the market and build your market in the gap. Mm, so like that's that. what I, I, I chose to do. Mm. So instead of just selling watches, I'm like, nah, let me just sell time telling devices in general. Mm. So I started selling wall clocks and compasses and hourglasses and Da Vinci clocks and sundials to kind of create a time telling. Experience. Yeah, so not yeah. just watches, yeah. but anything that told time. time. <laughs> so I was, that was yeah. the beginning of my idea to build a horology industry that was not in Ghana. So I started doing that. Then I moved on to just, from just selling watches to repairing them. Hmm. Now, well, there are people who have good watches, but their leather straps yeah, are yes. spoiled. They don't want to buy a new watch just to change their leather. Hmm. I went to Cantamanto to learn how to make leather straps, learned leather craft for three months, being an apprentice to a shoemaker. Wow started buying tools and taking them home, practice on how to make leather straps. Mm. Made a lot of bad leather yeah. straps. Um, then 
uh, apprenticed with watch repairers to learn watch repairs. So it was like a bit of everything coming together little by little. Learning about watches. I was so obsessed with watches. You, and you had a passion for it. I had you a had the space to make mistakes. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I felt like for once, mm -hmm. I had a space to make, make my own mistakes. mistakes. Yeah and to practice and practice and get perfect yeah. for, once, for once i felt yeah. this relief like i could now practice my creativity mm -hmm. and that's so important yeah. to make mistakes yeah. right? and perfect it in the in yeah the so that's what happened and yeah. i added value so it took me about three years mm -hmm. so why caveman why the name caveman um, <laughs> okay yeah so at the time when i was making leather straps at home i became more introverted the already introverted guy <laughs> became more introverted yeah. i would stay home for a week and not even step out just making straps practicing it used to take me about eight hours to make a pair of straps wow. very bad straps very and i would make them again, again yeah. you know so when people used to call me out even to the basketball court i'll be like go. charlie i did my cave inside oh ah. just jokingly but the main reason behind the name was that i used to um while working watch documentaries mm -hmm. And I was really fascinated by these um, geographical findings from uh, things that were created by these prehistoric people. Mm, yes. And the things are still in museums, still very durable. Yeah. Um, the pyramids, for example, there's an ongoing debate. Even the modern day scientists cannot understand how those people with no technology build some complex structures. That still stand. That yeah. still stand, you know. So I used to get very fascinated about how creative they were yeah. and how durable their work was. So I wanted to build a brand that would depict the values of durability, handcraft, mm. and originality, like how the cavemen built their things. Yeah, and you were sort of becoming a caveman yourself. Uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> you were. So that was my reason behind the name. You, that was your reason. <laughs> now, what was the biggest, most difficult moment in your business that you can remember? The beginning, the beginning, having to convince people that that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And my mom, uh, she wasn't very convinced. Mm -hmm. She was like, go and look for a job, you know. And back then, anyone I went to sell a watch to would pull a chair and sit me down and interview me. Young man, why are you doing this? Wow. A young man like you, why don't you go and look for a job? Why are you doing this? It was hard. That is hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so every sale that I made, yeah. I had to go through the hassle of that that and the question why as a young man you wouldn't look for a nine to five yeah i had wow. to it was very hard mm. you know i was like should i stop should i keep doing it because the pressure was coming from friends family people would laugh at you when we had gatherings like oh anthony what do you do now then somebody said, oh he's selling watches so that everybody it's laughs funny. yeah you know it was hard but mm. i'm glad i broke through it yeah and and do you, don't you think that that's a problem like many young people think of the nine to five and it i even advised a yeah. nine to five path instead yeah. of just dreaming it's a huge problem yeah. i wrote about it in my book um i realized that our definition of success is very flawed it's really really flawed um we kind of like the our culture is teaching us to ditch our talents yeah. and try to fit into the nine to five because there were just a few handful of uh, careers that were noted to be successful yeah. careers and parents wanted to brag that their children yeah, were doctors their children or are. lawyers yeah. so whatever talents you had once it's out of this handful mm -hmm. of careers you're being pushed to ditch it and you know try to fit in yeah. so it has been a problem and i am trying to advocate for parents to allow their children to express what their God-given talents yeah. are. And to dream. To dream, you yeah. know. The world is changing now. People are making money out of things that uh, decades back you wouldn't imagine that someone could make, make money out of. Yeah. I always say there's a food vlogger now. He goes to a restaurant, oh, yes. <laughs> gets free food, yeah. eats free food, and gets paid. Yeah. There's so many jobs that have been created that and people would never have thought <laughs> yeah. that they would have yeah. to create. So now I think yeah. society, uh, social media technology has given us a chance to uh, be profitable. And you think that young people in Ghana and Africa yeah. are taking advantage of it enough? It's growing. Yeah. Not fast enough. Mm -hmm. Not fast enough, but it's growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as we draw to, I mean, I could really talk to you for quite a, <laughs> quite a long time, but 
talking about social media, I was scrolling through your Instagram uh, okay, page, okay. and I saw something, a caption, that okay. I thought to be quite interesting, right? And it said, life, mm -hmm. it was like in 2019, it says, life, happiness, uh, life, happiness and pain intertwined, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I personally found that to be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. What pain have you had to deal with in your life? Um... I don't know what to single out. Nothing in your your, your personal life. No, no no painful mo moment that you can remember that you're willing to share because I'm sure there is definitely something. I hope you're not asking about like whatever you can not share. Not like no. relationship related. I'm it's not all asking. business. It's all business related, right? No, I mean, who is Anthony <laughs> outside of business? Uh, there are definitely issues that are pain relation wise. Yeah. I think we've all had to deal with relationship yeah. challenges once in a while. Mm -hmm. So I've had my fair share of it. <laughs> How do you deal with pain? <laughs> I, I get back to work. Is that a healthy solution? I don't yeah. know any other way to. Um, when I deal with pain, I kind of find satisfaction in getting results with my work. So it's like an escape for me. It's like an escape. Yeah, so when I'm dealing with things... Um, kind of got disoriented for a week or two you, you, could, you could literally tell by looking at me that <laughs> and normally when i'm going through things i start writing on social ah, media a lot mm. like i'm always posting okay. something so those who know me will call me you like are you okay <laughs> yeah mm. you know so mm. yeah but yeah just after a week or two i kind of like shake it off fold my sleeves like let's get back to work mm. You know, and when I find results with work, yeah. kind of overshadows any problems for me. Work, work, work. Work. <laughs> you know, life is, is, I mean, twofold. Like, there are many things that make up life. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have said that for you, work is your escape, it's your yeah. everything. But I just want to know, um, are you fulfilled entirely with work? Do you, what's the plan for Anthony as a whole, in terms of you know, people, let's, let me just put it simply. You're a successful bachelor, I presume. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but what are your dreams and desires in that area of life? Do you have any? Oh, work. Work has consumed my life a lot. And um, I kind of had challenges. I've had challenges in my personal life dealing with relationships. Wow. So. Because of work, okay? Mm. Um, you know, just like an example. So you're with someone and then you're on your phone mm -hmm. the thing about having an online business too is that you constantly have to keep your eyes on the page yeah. somebody could come and write something hurtful mm -hmm. on your business page and if you don't take it out immediately it could have you yeah. know so i kind of like respect every notification mm -hmm. sound yeah <laughs> to check you know mm -hmm. so kind of you can imagine mm -hmm. Having to be with someone and you always pick your phone. Yeah. So that sometimes become an issue. Oh, you're always on your phone. I'm like, it's work. It's work. What comes first for you? Yeah, I mean, like, you're always on your phone. You're always on your phone. It's hard for, for me because of uh, the amount of mental burdens that I have. Mental burdens. Yeah, relating to my work. work. So, you know. Anybody who probably had dated somebody doing a nine to five mm. and had come to me will see a difference. We'll see a difference. And maybe not everybody can comprehend it. Yeah. So yeah, I've had my fair share of those kind of challenges. Mm. But um I always get back to work. <laughs> Do you think there's some point in your life where not work alone will not be able to fill it all? Do you desire for family? Do you desire Of course for kids? I do. Yeah. But I desire for family that is well prepared for. Okay. Mm. Um, I want to have the kind of family that I have made good arrangements for. Arrangements being? Financially, mentally, mm. emotionally, spiritually, and everything. Yeah. So yes, I'm, um, I, I, I'm, I'm taking the right steps in that direction. Mm. To have good grounds before family comes in. Yeah. But you're happy and you're fulfilled at this stage of your life. I am. I try to be. I am. You I'm try just, to be. <laughs> I, don't, I think it's normal. It's normal to have bad days and um, it's normal. I don't think I have a life where everything is perfect, but I have a life where I've come to understand that the good and the bad are necessary for growth. Yeah. So, yeah.
<laughs> Your smile is very interesting to me. Hmm. I wish I could say I have a happy life, but that's not realistic. It's normal. Everybody has bad times. Has bad times. Yeah. But for the most part, what's the, if you had to, like, what percentage is happy and what percentage is sad? Difficult question. Maybe like, mm, I think 80, 20, mm. 90, 10, I don't know. Mm. But I'm not a miserable person going around. I have fulfillment from a lot of things. So, um, I, there's a lot of fulfillment from business. I mean, we are helping people. Driven. Where is there no fulfillment? As you round up. Where, where is, is there, there no, no fulfillment? fulfillment? Yeah. I, I think it's just that, like, I get that question a lot about family, you know. Almost all my friends are getting married and having children, and I'm like... Do you uh, feel that there's a gap in your life? Uh, uh, timing. I'm patient. Yeah. It's not a gap. It's just the time. Mm -hmm. And it will happen, yes. Yeah, so. it will happen. <laughs> <laughs> it will happen. It will happen. Mm -hmm. You desire it, anyway. Yeah, least. I do. That's, yeah. that's a first step. Yeah, I think it's a good question, but yes. Mm -hmm. I desire to have a good family. One that I have, like I said, prepared for well. Yeah. So you don't I don't want to repeat what your your father. I think so. Be. Yes, I want to have a happy home. Mm -hmm. So, um, anything that I think would be a threat to me having a happy home, I would cut it off. Yeah. Until I mean everything falls in place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And how soon is that? Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing and for being open all right this is the, mo this is the most personal interview uh, i've ever had <laughs> it's just been about work 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 hmm. but i think you've been able to push some buttons well. <laughs> to ask very delicate <laughs> I'm questions glad. i enjoyed it thank it's, you it's been i'm great. glad you did yeah i'm glad you did so thanks for being a pioneer and for changing the story great yeah thank you thank you so much and i wish you the best in every aspect of every fulfillment aspect. in every aspect, every aspect. <laughs> thank you so so much anthony thank do you. stay with us here on the nasty fortune we've got fantastic with anthony next <laughs> Welcome back to the Natalie Fort Show. I've been in conversation with Anthony Jamifer, and uh, now it's time for us to go into Fantastic this evening. Anthony, you were feeling the heat earlier, <laughs> but now it's time for us to lighten up the mood with Fantastic. Great. So, the name of the game that I picked for you, of course, because of your caveman, is called Tune Time. Okay. okay. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Okay. So here are the instructions. In maximum one minute, we're going to have our timer running. Maximum one minute. You're expected to think of a song, any song, that has the word time in it and sing. No. <laughs> that must be perfect just for the fun of it. Sing or rap uh, verse of that song that has the word time. Shall we? Shall we get our timer running? Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> so three, Some you have one minute to think of a song, sing or rap it. Just a verse of it with a word time. Three, two, one, go. Quickly. You haven't gotten one? Producer, help me. <laughs> no, no one is helping. <laughs> you have three tries, so don't worry. Um, yeah? I can think Okay, of second, time. one minute. We give you one minute more. Somebody should help me. A with song with the time. time. I, I have one in my head. It's like so help me. I, How can I help oh, you? I <laughs> um, song with time. Can I give you a hint? Please do. I can't. Okay, just think, think of it a bit longer further. Yeah? You know what time is. Sakodie! Well. <laughs> oh my god, do you not listen to Sakodie? You know what time it is. Yeah, that that's, it? that's his slogan, so. Uh, <laughs> the title of this. Not the title! He says to, he says to his songs, it's a lyric in his song. So. Uh, oh, no, no. Oh I'm sorry, my I feel that this. <laughs> no, I feel that this. I'm days. surprised. No, Sakodie says you know what time it is, right? Okay. But that's not part of the song you're saying. Yeah, I don't know which of his songs to pick that I can rap along or sing. So, currently, you can't think of any song. <laughs> no, I can't. 
<laughs> Anthony, thank you. Thank so, you. So, so much for being on the Natalie Fortune. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story. You've been watching the Natalie Fort Show. Do stay with us. We've got Star Woman and Proud of My Hustle next. Welcome back to the Natalie Ford Show. It's now time for Star Woman, where we put the spotlight on women in Ghana and across the world that are doing phenomenal things. This segment is brought to you by APSA Bank Ghana. Now, for all of you women out there, get APSA Emerge, the solution that helps you balance it all. APSA Emerge is a business banking solution designed for women entrepreneurs that goes beyond banking. APSA Emerge gives you access to expert business advice, exclusive networking opportunities, lower interest rates on loans and COT free banking. It includes exciting lifestyle benefits that help you balance your busy life. So sign on to APSA Emerge today. That's Africanicity, that's APSA. Visit apsa.com.gh or call our team on 030 397 9535. Remember that terms and conditions do apply. Here's our star woman at an MC. Hello everyone, my name is Eton Amsi, a communication strategist, founder CEO of Inspire Today. I'm really not sure where that came from, or I should think that the glitz and the glamour that comes with it, you're on TV, you look nice, you have nice hair, nice clothes. So people think that women in the media are rich, very, very rich, and your pastor at work is expecting, at a church is expecting, your family members, your siblings, everybody thinks you've hit some gold, and it's crazy. Um, I think that would be the first misconception about women in the media. The second misconception is that women in the media are rude. And that's because, you know, our job comes with a lot of reading, researching, so you're on top of your business, you speak with a lot of confidence. So people, if someone doesn't know you personally, they think you're rude, they think you are, um, you are, so you find a lot of people in the media space not married, a lot of the women not married because other people are thinking that you're too high class, you, you think you are all that. So this will be the two main biggest misconceptions about women in the media. We need to tell people the truth. Um, if you're saying the narrative in terms of um, earning our place in the business, if it's earning our place in the business, we need to work hard. I don't believe in being handed over something just because you're a woman or just because you have a pretty face or you sound good on TV, on radio. You need to earn your place. You need to read. You need to um, you need to let people know why they're giving you an opportunity to be there. And so earn your place. Work hard. Read. And also tell people the truth. Up and coming young women must know that the media doesn't pay. I mean, if you want to be in the media to make money, you're in the wrong business. So you should be in the media because the passion is what drives us. You'll be at work from dawn to dusk. It doesn't pay, but because you know that you're impacting society, that is why you're there. So we must work hard. We must earn our place. And we must earn our place at the table. And we must tell the young people the truth about what the profession really entails. I think that we need to do a lot more than we are doing now. I mean, usually you find documentaries and it's just centered in the greater Accra region or the cities. If you go to the rural communities, you see that like women are really, really struggling. There are people whose stories must be told. So I think that the media must work. We have some media houses who are already doing it. We have to go beyond and tell the stories of women who are doing so much. So you go to a community where women are selling gari, a woman wakes up and does her six children, she's taking care of them and she's working hard. She has a, she's a farmer and she's working hard so that her produce can go out there. You have women who are doing excellently well, not just women who are sitting in the office, but women who are doing excellently well. And our stories must be told. And it must not be told only when we are marking International Women's Day. It must be told every blessed day.
Oh, I, I'll say the biggest breakthrough for me was when I was put on the morning show. I didn't know how big that platform was, was until I was put on the morning show because everything you say, eh, let me use the court word, can be used against you in the court of law. <laughs> so eh, when you're on the morning show, you have to be extremely careful and be sure what you say because people take your word for it it's a big platform and for me i was put on the show when just before we went on a lockdown and so there were people at home we had eyeballs it gave me the visibility even up until today people still remember me for being on the morning show. it's my it, it, by far my biggest media breakthrough i think we should take out the easy because it's difficult <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely difficult, Natalie. There was a time I was running a 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. schedule because I was on the morning show. So I, I, I leave the house at 4 a.m. I get to work at 5. I do my makeup and get ready. We go live at 6 a.m. And then we are on till 10 a.m. When I'm done, I go to the newsroom, put together stories, do all we can do, and get ready for News 360. I mean, I was on it with you a few times. And it's not a joke. So by the time I'm leaving the house, my kids are asleep. By the time I get back, they're asleep. And on Saturday, I'm on radio from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. It's not a joke. But you see, what I know in this world and with every profession is that when there's a will, there's a way. If you're willing to do something, you find a way to do it. And so I just had to find a way. And I must say that I have a very supportive husband. And my, my family has been supportive when I'm not around. They find a way and sit in. I don't think that I've come this far in my career, but for the support of my husband. He's been there every step of the way. You know, I think what makes me smile is when I see other people happy, especially people who cannot give me any, any, anything back in return. <laughs>